Shalom and uh, welcome to the Middle East Report. I've just come back from a solidarity mission to Israel, sponsored by the International Christian Embassy at Jerusalem, UK, where we saw the terror sites that occurred on October the 7th, the magnitude of this evil perpetuated by Hamas. And so in this programme we're discussing, is October the 7th denial the equivalent of Holocaust denial? Well, welcome to the programme and uh, today's special guest is a good friend of mine. He's a good friend of the Middle East Report and Revelation TV. Needs no one introduction, uh, Robin Benson from the south coast of England. Robin, it's uh, great to see you, especially as this is my first recording after the solidarity mission that I went on last week to Israel post October the 7th to see uh, what Israel is going through right now, to visit the South, to visit the North, to show solidarity with uh, Israeli uh, legislators in the Knesset. Mm. And uh, a big thanks to the International Christian Embassy at Jerusalem UK for sponsoring myself and, uh, and my good friend um, Reagan King to go out to Israel. But um, Robin, um, share with us uh, your thoughts on something that we are going to discuss in this programme and we need to discuss and that is this growing evil conspiracy theories and which is being played out on social media uh, regarding the horrific mass terrorist attack that was committed by Hamas on October the 7th but instead they're saying that Israel perpetuated this attack instead. Simon what a world that you and I and our viewers out on Revelation TV <coughs> uh, live in that within the space of what 24 48 hours after this barbaric attack on October the 7th the internet was already flooding with people with all sorts of denial all sorts of conspiracy theories and I think the sad reality is Simon that, that you and I live in a world where because of the internet because of social media anybody who can come up with one of these cockeyed, kooky ideas, stick it onto their social media platform, and there are loads of people out there who will just gobble it up and pass it on, and it becomes you know a hot potato that's spread around the world, sometimes literally in seconds. And this is this is <clears throat> for those of us who love the truth. Yes, the truth of God's word, but just the truth. This is now the battle that we are engaged in almost on a daily basis, counteracting the lies and, and trying to understand what's the best way to do that. But, you know, these are the things we're going to discuss as we get on into the program. No, absolutely. And I, I want to bring in a kind of personal element to this. So at the end of November, I was asked to speak on uh, God's mm. purposes for Israel and the Jewish people. So I spoke on Ezekiel uh, uh, 37, the uh, whole passage about the dry bones, looking at the restoration of the Jewish people, the restoration of the modern state of Israel in fulfillment of, of biblical <coughs> prophecy. I had no warning about it, so I had nothing prepared, and mm. thankfully the Holy Spirit took over. Mm. Um, but then afterwards, I was confronted by a man who actually believed that October the 7th was committed by the IDF as a pretext for the invasion of Gaza to commit genocide. Um, and my notes here. And um, so what are your thoughts on Christians who hold these uh, dangerous and disturbing anti-Semitic views in which they propagate these and prey on ignorant Christians? Um, share with us how mature believers in Yeshua need to expose these wolves. Well, okay. The best way for us to expose uh, the conspiracy theories, the lies that are out there. Uh, I think, you know, we, we first of all have to be grounded in the Word of God and the, you know, the prophetic scriptures that talk about the restoration of the Jewish people and, and all that's involved in that. But we also have to be prepared to stick our heads above the parapet Absolutely. and not let people like this character away with making these claims. When you and I know that there is so much 
video, audio evidence out there actually taken by the terrorists themselves with, you know, GoPro and mobile phones and all the rest of it and then stuck up on their own social media sites. I mean, it, on a human level, it defies logic, it defies belief that anyone can deny that the events of October 7th happened and that it was Islamic terrorists who perpetrated the deed. And for anybody to come from the other direction and, and claim that Israel did this as a false flag in order then to perpetuate the current conflict in the Gaza Strip is, I mean, it's bordering on insanity. And yet these are, to all intents and purposes, what you and I would probably term sane, well, I, don't, I wouldn't call them normal, but they would term probably be sane people who have bought into a lie and are quite prepared to, to spread it and perpetuate it without doing any research, without doing any background checks to, to actually find out the facts. Because actually we, we've reached a point, I think, in our society, certainly in this country, where truth no longer matters to a high proportion of the population. And therefore, what anybody puts up on their social media site, whatever the app that they're using, other people will take that as the truth coming from that individual, but they won't do due diligence to actually find out if it is true. Absolutely. I just want to read out an email from a viewer who's very hostile to me. He's a fan of the Middle East Report. And I just want to read out a, a, an email that he wrote uh, just, uh, just after October the 7th. It says, continuing on from my previous email of a few days ago, Simon Barrett did a Middle East report the week of the 7th of October attack on Israel by Hamas. They talked about babies murdered and beheaded and women raped. Had Simon fact-checked this before broadcasting this information? Uh, we knew straight away uh, this was false or fake news. He goes on to say, Hamas did not murder any babies, nor did they rape any women, nor did any other uh, of the fighters involved in that day. Notice the word fighters instead of terrorists. That's a very important emphasis to make. Uh, he goes on to say, uh, who were the 1,200 uh, Israelis killed that day? At least 400 or more were soldiers that were killed, but the rest of the civilians were not killed by Hamas. Bear in mind, Hamas were after live hostages, not dead ones. Palestinian fighters and Israeli civilians were killed by the Israeli military. Tanks and helicopters opened fire on buildings and cars containing Palestinians and Israelis. The carnage was immense. Buildings and cars were mangled. <coughs> this is how most of the civilians were killed. Some were killed in the crossfire. To date, almost 21,000 Palestinian civilians have been killed by Israeli bombs, shell fire and targeted shootings and executions. Now, having just come back from Israel, having just visited Kibbutz near Oz, having seen the destruction by Hamas of these vehicles, you know that this was carried out uh, by, by Hamas. You know from, for example, witness accounts of, uh, and hearing those personal witness accounts of what Hamas did on October the 7th. And to call yourself a Christian and to write an email like that, um, I think this is why I'm recording this programme today, mm -hmm. to expose these wolves and to expose this warped mindset that throws truth out the window because of their very... Uh, views that are very anti-Israel uh, and certainly against the Jewish people. Yeah, I mean, there, there are loads of statements made in that particular email from this individual that the facts don't bear out. He claims, whenever he wrote that email, that it was 21,000 Palestinian Arabs in Gaza have been killed by the IDF. Nobody knows how many Palestinian Arabs have been killed in the conflict and there are several factors in all of this. A, the, the health ministry in the Gaza Strip is controlled by Hamas, which is a recognized terrorist entity. So you cannot believe one word that comes out of any mouth of any Hamas spokesman. Hamas claims that all of those 21,000 are civilians. Well, up until, let's say a couple of days ago, Israel has acknowledged that they have eliminated at least 10,000 uh, Islamic terrorists. 
So immediately that figure is halved when you, you claim that they're civilians. Now, civilian, this is war. And any clown that writes a video like that, or writes an email like that, doesn't understand the nature of warfare. Across the centuries, civilians sadly will get caught in the crossfire. But Israel is lauded up and down by most normal people in the world for the extent that it goes to to try and protect civilians from getting caught in the crossfire. I mean, the. <laughs> I'm at a loss, Simon, how to respond to such a stupid email. And if this person claims to be a believer in Yeshua, he needs to get his head sorted out. He needs to get his heart back in the scriptures and find out what the God of Israel, the God of the Bible, says about his people. You and I are not setting up Israel as perfection. Absolutely. Okay. We're not. But we are also acknowledging that the Israel and the Jewish people are in an existential fight for their existence. As several people have said to me over the last three months, this is just a continuation of the war of independence. This is not Operation Swords of Iron or whatever the IDF is calling it. This is the war of independence part five, six, seven, eight, whatever it is, because ever since Israel was created as a nation state again, it has been fighting for its very survival. And these guys, look at their charter. Their charter, they say ex they exist until Israel and the Jewish people cease to exist. And that's what October the 7th was a foretaste of. And if they're not stopped, they will do it again and they'll get joined by Hezbollah and Palestinian Islamic Jihad and all of these other lunatics who want to bring the world to the brink of, you know, of, of total destruction. Absolutely. So let's have a look at this excellent uh, CBN news report uh, that really shows how we're seeing such an increase in October the 7th denial that can be compared now to Holocaust denial. This is day 16 of your daily reminder that Israel, not Hamas, is responsible for the massacre of Israeli civilians on October 7th, 2023. Called October 7th Truthers, this group believes Israel was behind the attack that killed 1,200 Israelis that fateful day. It entered the mainstream when an Oakland City employee blamed Israel for the attack during a city council meeting. There's not been beheadings of babies and rapings. Israel murdered their own people on October 7th. This Israeli military helicopter footage has been used to claim that the IDF intentionally fired on its own citizens. And in the conspiracy forum on Reddit with 2 million members, a person writes, there is a 100% chance that Israel is behind all of this. It's not like they don't have a long track record of false flag terrorism. Another writes, the world is a stage run by the Sons of Zion. The October 7th massacre of Israelis by Hamas is one of the most well-documented crimes in history, live-streamed for the world to see. And yet October 7th denial is spreading. This is the ultimate fake news. Rabbi Abraham Cooper of the Simon Wiesenthal Center says anti-Semitism since October 7th has skyrocketed. And those who have not experienced it personally uh, all they have to do is go up on social media. It's pervasive. It's increasing. Social media is tailor-made for conspiracy theories. You can manipulate photos, videos, information to, to bend it to whatever your uh, reality is, including creating a, a flat earth, whatever it might be. Cooper said the Jewish community was already in crisis mode before October 7th. Now the Anti-Defamation League says Jews face a threat level unprecedented in modern history. In December, almost 200 Jewish organizations across the U.S. were targeted with swatting incidents, false reports to the police of shootings or bomb threats. This Alabama synagogue had to be evacuated during a Shabbat service because of a bomb threat. People are, are on edge. They're nervous and we're going to continue to reassure them that it's safe to come to services. Even the anti-Semitism on college campuses is being called a false flag created by Jews. The website Gray Zone says it's a contrived campus anti-Semitism crisis. Cooper says no amount of evidence will change the minds of those who want to believe a conspiracy theory. The Nazis worked so hard 
to cover up their crimes and to erase evidence of the crimes. Hamas, they were live streaming it. We have people, who, they don't want to be confused by the facts. They don't want their worldview to be interrupted, even if it involves crimes against humanity and, and possible genocide. Dale Hurd, CBN News. And that's a good reminder um, that it was actually Hamas who committed the genocide on October the 7th. They are one who are perpetuating uh, massacres against Israeli <coughs> people and also other uh, nations that uh, are living and working in that close region next to the Gaza Strip uh, that occurred on that Black Saturday back on October the 7th. And this is what we have to bear in mind. And. Um, um, it was only a couple of weeks ago, uh, Robin, that I was actually invited to see if I would go on the uh, solidarity mission organised by the International Christian Embassy uh, mm -hmm. in Jerusalem. Um, and one of my main reasons why I wanted to go, I was a bit apprehensive about going, not because I was afraid or fearful about going into a war zone and knowing that you can't get any travel insurance when you go to Israel, and knowing that there's only one flight that's flying from London to Tel Aviv, and that's Al Al, because no one else will fly, uh, and, not, and knowing that we could see war break out between Israel and Hezbollah in the north at any time. I was afraid of seeing a different Israel, mm. um, seeing Israel in the aftermath of October the 7th. But having been there, I've got to say this is the most, one of the most incredible visits I've ever visited, mm. uh, to visit Israel uh, at this time. And one of the main reasons why I wanted to go was because I wanted to see for myself what Hamas did on October the 7th, mm -hmm. um, to counter those uh, conspiracy theorists, to counter those who believe the lies that they believe that, that it was actually the IDF um, that actually murdered uh, their own civilians on October the 7th. I was hearing reports uh, and personal conversations with IDF soldiers and officers who were actually telling me that they could not get the IDF down um, to confront Gaza on October the, over, over the 6th and it took them six hours because of the helicopters that they were using were being shot at uh, by Hamas terrorists using RPGs. Mm. So there was a huge delay in the IDF getting onto the scene mm -hmm. of the Nova Music Festival, onto the massacres that took place at the kibbutzes, mm -hmm. and also the just the destruction um, by Hamas. Um, isn't it important as well as, as Christians that we have a hunger for truth, that we research truth and find truth for ourselves, not only from the scriptures, but also when we are presented with news, and obviously anyone watching this program who doubts what I'm saying, please research it for yourself. Don't just rely on what uh, Robin and myself mm -hmm. are saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, it's important. <clears throat> but as I said before, we uh, are, are one of the major challenges that we're facing today is that people no longer, <coughs> excuse me, will accept an absolute truth. They won't accept something as the truth, even though they may be confronted with <coughs> obvious video evidence taken at the time they still will not accept the truth of, 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 of the events that unfolded on October the 7th. They won't accept the fact that <clears throat> the Israeli population is up in arms about what happened on October the 7th. They're asking all the questions about the security services, why didn't they know about the IDF, why didn't they respond. <clears throat> so you've got the Israeli population, that, you know, the man in the street is questioning its government, is questioning its security forces, it's questioning, in some senses, the very uh, foundation of the state of Israel on, on one level because of the failures on October the 7th. So therefore, for people to turn it around and say that Israel did this, again, flies in the face of the facts. But this is the problem. Don't confuse me with the facts. I don't want to know the facts. I want to see what the latest numpty out on some social media app is prognosticating and theorizing about what happened on October the 7th and what has happened since, because that's more appealing to my flesh. That's more appealing to my uh, desire to buy into conspiracy theories. That's more appealing to, in, to the, the spirit within me that hates the Jewish people, that hates Israel. And that applies to Christians. 
That applies to so-called born-again Christians. Yeah, I, I, I question whether as these, well as the man in the street. I question whether these people are really born. Well, that's again, a whole other issue, God. but you, you because know, you they cannot, would claim to be. You cannot hate Israel. You cannot hate the Jewish people, and yet claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, who, after all, is the Jewish oh, Messiah. I'm not sure, Simon. Um, I mean, so I mean, I, uh, I mean, yeah. I, I, yeah, I, 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 if we have hatred in our heart, any hatred in our heart for anyone. Yes. That is ungodly. Yes. Because we shouldn't have that. Yes. Uh, we should have peace and love in our hearts. Yes. We should love our neighbor as yes. ourselves, as Jesus commanded. Yes. So to hold these views and to perpetuate anti Semitic stereotypes, yeah. to hate the Jewish people, to hate God's land who he has uh, redeemed over the past 75 years yeah. uh, in fulfillment of his word then, you know, serious questions need to be asked. I, I, totally, I understand what you're saying, and, I, and in some senses I totally agree with you, but we also live at a time when the ancient, you know, replacement theology and all of the anti-Judaism and the anti-Jewish uh, feelings, okay, let's not use the word hate, feelings that that brought into the early church beyond the time of the apostles. It's been like an infection, a virus that has circulated in the body of Jesus for nearly 2,000 years. And every so often it raises its head and comes back full force. And it has come back full force since October the 7th. Uh, and, and, and therefore, there are people who, you, you and I may question it, but they would claim to be born again Christians who have bought into this viewpoint. And this is the fruit of it. This sort of stuff that you're dealing with, the sort of things that we're watching every weekend in London and in other places with these enormous marches, filled with hatred, and there are Christians involved in these things. Absolutely. Well, they need deliverance, and they need to come to a place of forgiveness because God loves Israel. He loves the Jewish people. And here's my own personal report from a car park that actually held, or does hold, uh, 1,300 cars destroyed by Hamas. And this is only one of three uh, car parks like this in southern Israel. Just a warning, uh, what you see is very graphic, it's very distressing, um, but you need to see this because this is truth. Hi, this is uh, Simon Barrett of Revelation TV in the UK. What you can see behind me is one of the cars that was uh, attacked on October the 7th, yeah, the worst mass terrorist attack in Israel's history, where Israel was confronted by approximately two to 3,000 Hamas terrorists on that day. You can see the carnage they've done with the cars behind me with these Iranian-supplied grenades that uh, ignite and inflame these cars and actually burn them to ashes. And for those people who really do question whether October the 7th happened, well, here's the crime scene, here's the evidence of the mass murders that took place on October the 7th. And it's a reminder of the world to wake up, to realize this is terrorism. This is the worst kind of terrorism that we've seen um, in decades, certainly comparable to 9-11. And the magnitude of the destruction that occurred on October the 7th is nothing less than absolutely horrific and evil. And you can see with the evidence behind the total total carnage caused by Hamas back on October the 7th. I want to take you back to October the 7th and uh, you can see behind me how this uh, beautiful black 
Audi has been absolutely shot to bits by Hamas terrorists and around us we see the absolute carnage caused by Hamas on October the 7th. Uh, this is real, um, this happened and uh, what we're seeing here until recently was a crime scene. You can see car after car after car just barked up here uh, with their windscreens shot to bits, tyres burnt out. Um, it's, it's a scene of absolute carnage and absolute terror. And to be one of those Israeli drivers on October the 7th when Hamas carried out this terrorist attack must have been absolutely horrific. And the world needs to know what happened on October the 7th. This is the equivalent of what happened in the Shoah or the Holocaust to realize the true magnitude of the scale of this attack by Hamas back on October the 7th. As you can see, this was uh, until recently a crime scene. This is uh, the biggest crime scene I've ever seen. I'm sure the biggest crime scene that you've ever seen. But I want to show you this car because this just brings uh, to life how personal this is. Because in this car, uh, looks like these were just in Israeli day trippers. They, they packed their bags for the beach. And then you can see in the back seat is a, a children's book. Um, and then in the front, personal items with uh, pens, which makes it very, very personal of what happened, that these people uh, did not expect to see what they saw on October the 7th. And it just brings that personal element that these were people, real people, who in one moment, their life was just taken. And it describes really what the Bible talks about is suddenly, uh, people are saying peace and safety and suddenly there is no safety and um, we can see this with here this sudden sudden terrorist attack on October the 7th by Hamas and, and that these are real people who drove these cars on October the 7th so so what we can see in this car is that these poor people had absolute no chance of, of survival going on a, a, a family day out uh, to the beach to the south and then to be confronted by Hamas terrorists on October the 7th is just beyond horrific. Words can't describe the magnitude of what we're seeing here. The total, total destruction by Hamas, killing innocent, innocent Israeli civilians in their car who had no self-defence, self no way of getting out of those situations. And you wonder why? Israel is launching a military operation into Gaza to destroy Hamas. Well, it's because of this. And uh, we have uh, Jonathan uh, Parsons, who's the son of David Parsons, who works for ICEJ in Jerusalem, uh, to thank for editing that and uh, recording that video with me um, last week. Um, what are your thoughts? Because for me, that was highly emotional. Yeah. I, I never expected to see what I saw, as we saw in that report. Yeah. And what, what, I, what surprised me the most, I think, was the magnitude mm. of October the 7th, the sheer scale of it was absolutely huge. And now the reports coming out, they believe now that somewhere in the region of 5,000 Hamas terrorists took part mm. in committing massacres and atrocities yeah. Yeah. on October the 7th. Well, again, you, you can look at the footage, again, captured by the terrorists themselves, uh, of them streaming across the border uh, when they broke through, you know, over 20 places on the Gaza, the fence you know, the security fence that separates Israel from, from the Gaza Strip. And you can see from the footage that it's not only just Hamas terrorists, you also see ordinary Ga Gazan civilians following them. And this is, this is the reality. You know, people talk about the innocents in Gaza, and there are innocents, so please don't, you know, um, come screaming back that, you know, that there are no innocents. There are... There are, there, are, there are innocents in Gaza, but there are a lot of people who are not innocent, who, who the press claims are, and that includes several thousand who streamed with the terrorists and just started looting. 
We saw that. We saw that. We saw the evidence of that yeah. in uh, when we visited um, Kibbutz near Oz. And, yeah. and what was so chilling for me, two things were very chilling for me after we visited that car park with those cars devastated by Hamas. And, and also I want to say that um, the burnt cars, there was a, a Hamas used a, a special liquid, a flammable liquid mm. that the Iranians supplied, um, which enabled those cars with the Israeli uh, passengers and drivers still in those cars to burn instead of for two or three hours to burn for 12 hours. Mm. And I did pick up, I'm um, going to show our viewers now, right? This is a, 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 a shell case from one of the bullets um, used by a sniper, Hamas sniper on October the 7th, mm. right? To say, look, here, this is real, this happened. Mm. Um, I, and I wanted to take back this to prove that this did happen on October yeah. the 7th. But what, one thing w was very chilling is that after we visited that car park, um, we were can on I, a sorry, Can I ask you a question? Course, course you the car park that you went to, was that only associated with the Nova Festival? The vast majority okay. of the cars okay. were. So each of those festival. vehicles, whether they're burnt out or bullet ridden, uh, represents at least one, if not more individuals who were caught while attending the Nova Festival. Yeah, yeah. correct. I mean, so we had, uh, what you didn't see on there, there was also uh, caravans that were mm. there. Uh, we saw the burnt out camper van there. There were mini buses there. Um, and then the other thing that was very disturbing um, that we actually saw there was I looked in some of the cars and literally on one of the cars, there was like a vodka bottle mm. and another bottle. So obviously they'd been drinking that night and their alcohol was in the car. So you know, that the drivers in this car attended the Nova Music Festival. Mm. And that's just one of three of, sh of the big car parks right. um, that occurred. And then we were on a coach, we drove past the site of the Nova Music Festival. Mm. I mean, I've never seen Israel so green. Uh, we had so much rain. Mm. Um, and it was just um, a surreal, just surreal, very peaceful. Yeah. You saw Israeli investigators still at the scene yeah. of the Nova Music Festival. Yeah. I think there's something, last time I read about it, I think there's something still in the region of three to four hundred bodies or body parts that they still have not been able to identify who they are. So you have to think, okay, that means that there are relatives and friends of that individual four months into this conflict who are still in trauma. They are still distressed wanting, waiting to know, did my loved one get, actually get slaughtered by these barbarians or is my loved one in the Gaza Strip as a, you know, as a captive? I mean, th we, what we don't realize, I think, Simon, and I'm sure probably you, you, you became very aware of it, that Israel is a nation that is permanently in mourning. There is no let up to the trauma and the distress. It just perpetuates one day after yeah. another. Yeah, uh, absolutely, and, and, and I will go on from what you're saying there, but you know, we, what was chilling for me as well is uh, we got to a road junction after the Nova Music Festival. And I remember that road from, from the, straight after October the 7th, of actually airing on this program, um, Hamas terrorists um, uh, actually, using their guns and shooting mm -hmm. the Israeli cars. Mm -hmm. I was on that road, I saw that road, and that was chilling. And then I saw a signpost for Kibbutz near Oz, and also for Kibbutz Narin. Now, back in December 2022, we visited Kibbutz Narin on behalf of the Christian Media Summit, mm. where we were addressed by the Eshkol Regional Council. So to meet those leaders, to meet those people at those kibbutz who are real, and those beautiful kibbutzes and knowing that these were destroyed by Hamas mm -hmm. was horrific. But I don't think anything then prepared me for what I personally saw at uh, Kibbutz near Oz, and we've got some pictures to show you now. The total devastation caused by Hamas, um, and uh, you know, literally targeted by Hamas's RPGs. And what was also very chilling as well is not only the destruction of these kibbutz, it felt like uh, you're witnessing history, it felt like this was a, a program, or this is what the Holocaust would have been like. But um, what was so disturbing as well is that the Israelis put pictures, posters, of those who had been kidnapped by Hamas mm -hmm. on the doors of their homes. Mm -hmm. 
so to actually visit this kibbutz, beautiful kibbutz, and you can see there from the photos that I took, it's a beautiful kibbutz, uh, beautiful gardens, peace-loving people, mm -hmm. only a mile away from Gaza, and this is the devastation caused um, by Hamas on October the 7th. Yeah, and that's an interesting point to just draw out at this point, that most of these kibbutzim along the Gaza border were inhabited by secular Israelis who had constantly wanted to reach out and embrace the citizens of the Gaza Strip. I mean, many of them were the ones who were, in, you know, organizing for people from the Gaza Strip to come and work in the kibbutzim. Yep. And yet they're the ones who bore the brunt of the attack, you know, aside from the Nova Festival on the actual day. So in other words, the people who are who have been advocating and advocating and advocating for decades for peace with the Palestinian Arabs, for peace with Hamas and the Gaza Strip, they're the ones that Hamas attacked first. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, and the other aspect to this one as well is that we were literally only a mile away from Gaza mm -hmm. and you could hear the Israeli artillery, artillery um, guns going off. Mm -hmm and you could hear the booms, mm -hmm. and you could hear the shakes, but uh, there was no moment of, of being fearful, and just, um, just grateful for the opportunity to show solidarity and love and support to the Jewish people and to Israel for what they're going through. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, I mean I, 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 only when I went there did I see the magnitude of what happened on October the 7th. As a broadcast journalist, you know I've recorded programs, uh, since October the 7th, the aftermath of it, analysed it, but it's not until you're there mm -hmm. and you see with your own eyes what happened, yeah. you then realise the, the true horror and extent of this. But for me, what I took so much comfort in was the bravery and the courage shown by the IDF soldiers and having the opportunity to meet with them, mm -hmm. have an opportunity then to speak with them as well um, on, um, on their mission to protect Israel from Hamas. And let's also remember as well, Robin, that the IDF is not only protecting Israel from existential threat, but they're protecting uh, the West, they're protecting Britain and Europe and the United States of America from this evil, demonic, Islamist ideology mm -hmm. that would destroy the world if had yes. a chance. And Israel is on the front line. Yeah, totally agree with you, Simon. And I think the thing that we also need to keep bringing back into the mix you know, whenever we talk about that is the Iranian element, which is the foundation. I mean, Iran is funding, supplying, training, all that's going on, whether it's Hezbollah, the Houthis, Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, it doesn't matter who it is at the present time that's attacking Israel from whatever side, the Iranian regime, we're not talking about the Iranian people, we're talking about the Iranian Shiite regime in Tehran are the main the main functionaries, the main perpetrators behind everything that has been going on from the Islamic side since October the 7th and way before. But Iran is the, you know, the chief motivator in it all. Uh, and, and again, it just beggars belief you know, that, that so much of the West is just sitting back and allowing this to happen. But also the other equation I didn't know until I was there is that Egypt holds a lot of responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, and how much, and all the weapons that was used on October the 7th by Hamas were smuggled through the Rafa crossing from Egypt. Mm -hmm. You know, so we're talking about these very sophisticated inflammatory bombs mm -hmm. that, uh, that are burning these cars with the Israelis in them for, for 12 hours. Mm -hmm. That was supplied by the Iranians. The RPGs, that was supplied by the Iranians, had to come through the Egyptian yeah. uh, crossing. Yeah. So Egypt um, plays a major responsibility in all of this and this is something that I didn't know until you see the magnitude of it and say well where did these weapons come from mm -hmm. who gave Hamas these weapons how did Hamas smuggle these weapons into Gaza and there's only one route and that's through Egypt mm -hmm. so the Egyptian government and authorities um, have a lot of responsibility for what happened on October yeah. the 7th despite the fact that Hamas would would quite happily yeah. destroy uh, yes, the, the uh, government, e Egyptian, e yeah, Egyptian government, yes. and also that Hamas, as part of the Muslim Brotherhood, pose an existential threat as well yeah. to the regime in Cairo. And this is the same Egypt that yesterday, or the day, I think it was yesterday or the day before, announced that if one Palestinian refugee crosses the border into the Sinai, 
the Egyptian peace treaty with Israel will be null and void. I mean, you know, you think, okay, this is the, supposedly the, the peace partner that Israel has on its southern border. And yet, when push comes to shove, as is so often the case, Islam comes first. And, and, and loyalty to this ideology comes before anything else. And therefore, you have the situations as you've described. But also, I, I would have thought, and these are also my, my thoughts as well, after coming back from Israel last week, you would have thought that the Israelis' number one priority is to destroy Hamas mm -hmm. or to take out revenge for what happened on October the 7th. Mm -hmm. No, it's not. Their whole 100% concern is getting the remaining hostages home. Yeah. You see posters of hostages at the airport, at Ben Gurion Airport, in Jerusalem, all over the country, including in the north with giant posters and areas of towns where one of those uh, family members have been taken, there's huge posters everywhere mm -hmm. of the hostages. Yeah. They care more about the plight of the hostages than they do about their own soldiers fighting against Hamas in Gaza uh, to actually destroy, destroy Hamas. Now we do have uh, um, a personal account, and it's so important to hear personal stories, and this is a, a courtesy from my friends at the Israeli Defence Force, of one soldier who is a medic in the IDF and his experience on October the 7th. Just taking his RPG, staring right at me. He missed from around 10 metres. What moment did you understand what was happening? I woke up at base at 5 a.m. like every morning. They send out like uh, un just units just in case to like be on standby inside their vehicles. And uh, you're just on standby like for anything that happens. Well, something happened on October 7th. Um, so as I said, we woke up just like every other morning. And at around 6.30 a.m. we started hearing a lot of blasts above us and uh, they became increasingly closer. We weren't very worried because, you know, it happens. Gaza, we get rockets fired at us all the time. Once the blast started getting like really close, that was when we, we realized something's wrong. And I just looked up and saw a mortar hit around 10 meters from, the, from our uh, armored vehicle. And at that point I knew well, we, we have to go somewhere. We have to go somewhere which is safe because the vehicle isn't armored against mortars. And we had a really big dilemma. We had a dilemma because we were the medical unit which was in charge of all the, all the forces were, which were on field. But at the same time, we knew if we stayed outside, then uh, we might die. And at that point, we started getting uh, calls on the radio uh, which said, like, um, that there were terrorists going into all the nearby uh, Yishuvim. One of my friends uh, was saying, well, if they're on all the Yishuvim, then they're about to be here. Pretty much at that moment, I, uh, I had my, uh, I realized what was going on. Everyone ran out from the Miguni to go and get their clothes. Mortars are dropping all the time. There, there's a red alert, uh, missiles, everything. I knew what I had to do. I knew that feeling anything wasn't gonna help. And I told myself that I'm gonna leave the feelings for later. I'll deal with it later. And just, you know, do my job. At that moment, I started hearing uh, fires shots from, uh, from the Shingimel, from, uh, from the base's entrance. And uh, I realized that there are terrorists right inside the base. They were wearing, uh, all kinds of like mixed gear. Everyone was dressed differently. They had, each one had his own vest. Uh, they all had, all had uh, AK-47s. We started uh, taking uh, a cover and we're waiting for them. And then I saw around six or seven terrorists just running to the other side of the base, going in. We started returning fire. Uh, we had grenades dropped on us. I remember very vividly uh, one of the Nukba soldiers just taking his RPG, staring right at me. He missed from around 10 meters. And uh, pretty much from the first 
shot that I fired, I couldn't hear anything. And uh, pretty much I started hearing uh, beeps and sounds and, and I couldn't listen to anything. We were worried that we were gonna f they were gonna flank us. So we went deeper into the base and uh, started taking covers uh, from there. Uh, we saw a few terrorists which were trying to go around us. We killed them. We were getting uh, calls which were injured soldiers and they were located in a specific migunit in the other side of the base. It was a very tough gunfight because we had to go, we had to go through a, a major part of the base to get to them. After another half an hour of uh, battling it out, we finally managed to get there. And then I see on the floor around 10 of my good friends, each one with a different type of injury. Um, then we started, uh, we started taking care specifically of what their injuries were. I was appointed to uh, a friend called Shoam. Shoam had, uh, he lost his, uh, a major part of his jaw and he couldn't breathe very well. So I was appointed to, uh, to pretty much sustain his breathing and uh, to clear out the blood that was uh, pouring into his uh, neck. Um, so I was with him about six hours until the first helicopter arrived, which we didn't understand what was happening because, you know, six hours for a helicopter is something that never happens. It's, I started realizing that what was happening wasn't gonna happen, wasn't like a specific uh, point in our base. It was happening all around. Very powerful to get uh, a, an IDF soldier's personal account of what he went through on October the 7th. And it's a reminder that we need to keep these brave and courageous men and women who are serving on the front line in Gaza against Hamas in our prayers. They don't want to be there. The, the Israeli government and the Israeli people do not want to be in Gaza, but they have to in the aftermath of what happened on October the 7th. If Israel allows Hamas, uh, to go on without defeating its terror network and its infrastructure and allows Hamas intact, then we're going to see something like October the 7th again, or much worse. So it's an imperative that Israel wins this battle. Uh, and it's tragic that we see um, the people of Gaza caught up in this. But also they have a major responsibility um, that they can also be free from Hamas. And that's what we want to see. Um, very emotional program, uh, Robin. Um, but I want to also then link what, you know, my own personal accounts of what I saw, the video content, the testimony of IDF soldier, of what happened on October the 7th, and tie in this October the 7th denial that we're seeing so much on so many social media platforms, mm -hmm. and then compare that to this huge rise we're seeing today in Holocaust denial. I mean, how can you deny that the Holocaust ever happened? Uh, I mean, it's outrageous. Uh, it's as outrageous as saying October the 7th was committed by the IDF. I mean, how do I respond to that, Simon? Because it is, it is, it is totally outrageous. Um, there is so much historical material to prove over and over and over multiple times that the Holocaust happened. And again, we go back to where we started this program. There is so much video material to prove that October the 7th happened. But there are some people in this world, in our society, in this nation that you and I live in, who don't want to accept the truth. And, you know, I was thinking about this as I was coming up on the train. Uh, and my, my mind, my memory went to the scripture in 2 Thessalonians 2, where Paul is talking, yes, he's talking about the end times. He's talking about the return of the Lord. He's talking about the man of lawlessness. Interesting that expression could be translated Torahlessness, but that's a whole other subject for another <clears throat> discussion. But he also says that this spirit of lawlessness is already at work, and that was in his day. And as a result of that spirit of lawlessness, Paul says that God gives people who buy into a lie over to that deception. And I think that is a totally scary situation if you sit back and think about it. 
that if you and I or any other individual buys, uh, particularly a believer in Yeshua, a believer in Jesus, or someone who claims to be a born again believer in Jesus, buys into a lie and won't let it go and perpetuates it, there is the possibility, as far as I can see from Scripture, that there comes a time when God says, okay, go with it. Swallow the deception. It's yours. And he's not going to do anything to intervene. And I have no idea, you know, biblically where that person will end up. But we, have, we, we are facing this reality, you know, in, in the church and in our society today that so many people have bought into lies, they bought into deception, and it has actually become part and parcel of who they are. And how you shake them out of it, I honestly don't know. I don't know what the answer is. We can pray, of course we can pray. We can fast, we can intercede, we can plead with the Lord. But sometimes I wonder, you know, are we asking God to do something that he actually has decided he's not going to do? Now that's his business, not ours. But you know, th there is the reality of what the scripture says, that there comes a point where God says, okay, enough, go on your way. Yep, I'll give you over to a, a debased mind. Mm, uh, yes. Which is very, very scary. Yeah. Um, particularly if we read the first chapter of Romans as well. Exactly, that was the um, other one that was in my mind. Uh, but you know, uh, what is the Christian response to October the 7th? Isn't it to come out of our apathy, our indifference, and really stand up for Israel and the Jewish people? during this time because, you know, uh, having seen what, what I saw uh, in Israel last week um, and the magnitude of the terror, uh, it was like the gates of hell were literally unleashed on those Israeli communities in the south. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, uh, the magnitude of evil we saw, uh, I think is reverberating around the world. Yes. So isn't this a fantastic opportunity to <clears throat> reach out to the Jewish people in love who are scared with this huge rise of anti-Semitism to show solidarity with Israel. Because out of this, the Jewish people in Israel, the Israelis, are stronger, mm. they're defiant. They're asking questions about their, their Jewish identity, their role in life. Mm. I, I just want to say something poignant. So I have a very close family in Israel. Um, they are, well, they are friends, but they're like family. Mm. I've known them for a very long time. I've known them for, um, uh, since the uh, late 90s. And um, uh, Tao, one of my best friends, uh, she has a, a beautiful son called Kafir, and she has three sons. And uh, she was telling me last week, uh, we were having um, a dinner on, uh, on Thursday night, and she was saying that her boy came up to her and said, uh, Mummy, will Hamas take me? Will Hamas take you? Um, and I think this is a magnitude. We can, we can discuss the... <laughs> the effects of October the 7th. Mm -hmm. We can discuss Israel's war against Hamas in Gaza, but the deep mm -hmm. psychological trauma that's caused by this to Israelis is horrific. I had, one, um, I had one Jewish woman come up to me in the hotel, we're staying in Jerusalem, and she goes, um, she goes, are you a Christian? I said, yes. She said, thank you for being here. My home was destroyed by Hamas in Starot. Mm -hmm. My son, was fighting with the IDF, helping to protect us. He was murdered by Hamas on October the 7th. Mm. She's a wreck. Yeah. So yeah. I think we have to also, you know, not over-spiritualize this, yeah. but also look at the kind of practical needs of what Israelis are going through. And, yes. and even though we can't get travel insurance, I'll tell you what, the best thing to do is, is to visit Israel at this time. And uh, if you're gonna die, you might as well die in Israel <laughs> because you're closer to there. It's the Holy Land, yes. you know, but to show that love and solidarity yeah. with Israel is just so, so, so important at this time. Yes. I totally agree. We need to get alongside our Jewish friends, Jewish people, particularly here in the UK, and assure them that they are not alone. And I think they know that because there have been several, you know, solidarity rallies you know, in different places since October the 7th. But I think they probably need the constant reassurance that they are not alone and that there are, there are, are sane individuals, there are Christians who will stand with them through thick and thin. That we can do, we should do. If we can go to Israel, fine, good. But I think as believers in Yeshua, as believers in Jesus, we also have a responsibility to, uh, gently but firmly challenge any of this sort of stuff that we have been discussing in this program 
as and when it arises in our Christian circles, whether that's in a Bible study group or in a discussion over coffee after a church service or wherever, we don't let it pass. And that we also pray. I mean, so we've got three different, yeah, we've got three different prongs here that we, we need to pray. We need to beseech God to continue his sovereign work, whatever he is unfolding in the land of Israel at the present time. Absolutely. Uh, Robin, thank you so much for being my special guest on uh, this week's edition of the Middle East Port. And I want to thank you for watching this program home. We have a very moving uh, video um, produced by the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs um, regarding what happened uh, in the Holocaust. Now, as Christians who love Israel, we cannot tolerate wolves who perpetuate Jew hatred, who, who are actually deniers of what happened on October the 7th when the evidence is so overwhelming. And as Christians, we can't afford to be indifferent, apathetic towards Israel and the Jewish people. This is our moment to stand strong in support and love of Israel and the Jewish people. Thank you for watching the Middle East Report. Dear mom and dad, my beloved mother and father, I'm writing this just in case I don't survive, in case we never see each other again. In the face of uncertainty, our relatives were decimated and their faith seized by the hands of others. Six million hearts stopped beating and six million stories were left untold. I've grown up with these stories, with memories of relatives who were murdered during the Holocaust at Auschwitz, at Treblinka, at Dachau. I carry each and every one of them with me. Their strength and unity still reside within me. The feeling of fearing the worst, but still holding on to hope for the best hearing about the atrocities, but still unable to extinguish our spirit of being human beings and Jews. We must not forget these memories, ones that we will never again let happen, freedom that will never again be taken from us, our dignity that we will never again leave behind. We will never forget. <laughs>